hopefully get all the good stuff here. All right. So with that, I want to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Gemma Jang. Gemma applies complexity leadership theory, social network analysis, and a suite of facilitation methods to enable cross-disciplinary research teams to converge upon solutions for challenges of societal importance. Currently, she serves as the chief team scientist of two National Science Foundation funded multi-year, multi-institute, $15 million budget, budgeted projects. So Gemma, I will invite you to take it away. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Christine. Uh, it's good to see everyone. And uh, Interreach is my favorite team science community. And uh, I learned so much here and made so many friends. So um, I want to thank Christine, Christine for hosting the community. And also I want a, a big welcome to uh, Jenny Grobmeyer and Carmen here because they are my country egos in on those two um, large um, discipline, uh, large projects that I'm working on. And everything I'm going to talk about today and uh, they have their share of contribution. Uh, so, okay. Okay, so can everybody see my screen? Okay, good. So today my topic is gospel of team time, holding adaptive spaces in convergence research teams. So uh, our time together is gonna be divided into three parts. So the first is we'll talk about why do we need to talk about team time, where we introduce the concept of adaptive space, how that's related to complexity leadership and conscious meetings. Then we'll spend the majority of our time talking about the many, many phases of adaptive spaces, give you, share with you some examples, observations, and philosophy. Then we'll take a little pause and to hear from the audience. And if we have more time, we'll talk about what does an embedded team scientist do, the roles and responsibilities. So I named my presentation the Gospel of Team Time after the Gospel of Welsh. So I have always had a personal connection with Andrew Carnegie. So several stories. So I first came to the US as a master's student in business administration. So I had an academic internship in DC and uh, uh, where I took a class on nonprofit management because I was really interested in that topic. And one of the foundation readings in that class was the gospel of wealth. So where Andrew Carnegie talked about, you know, a rich man who does rich dies disgraced and he should, he should spend his, time, his money as much, with as much care and uh, uh, thoughtfulness as he earned his money because it's tremendous responsibility. So, and then with my previous job at the University of Pittsburgh, it's right next to Carnegie Mellon University and I pass by the campus all the time. So that was my story with Andrew Carnegie. So, and it's, so, the relation that how it is related to um, the topic is team time is team wealth. All you know, with all the team members I talk with, the teams I work with, they almost unanimously say, "Don't waste our time." You know, our biggest resources is our time. So team time is team wealth, and how we spend team time can either be energy giving or energy draining. So adaptive spaces are. A conscious, uh, how uh, are basically social spaces, how we can consciously spend team time. So the term adaptive space comes directly from complex leadership theory, which is the focus of my doctoral studies. So in complex leadership theory, there are three types of leadership uh, articulated. So the first is operational leadership. So in the context of convergence research teams, that would be the leadership team that oversees the governance structure, the administrative side of the project. And then there's the entrepreneurial leadership. And in the context of team science, it would be all the researchers who are engaged in pushing the boundary of discovery. That's our charge, right? And then there's this third kind of leadership, which is a new addition to the leadership vocabulary called enabling leadership. So enabling leadership holds the adaptive space in the middle and interfaces with both operational leadership and entrepreneurial leadership. So as a team scientist, I see most of my work in the realm of enabling leadership, holding the adaptive space. So my tagline for adaptive space, I made this up myself, is where interdependence is visible and interaction is different. So what do I mean by that? So let's take a deeper look. So we experience systems in many dimensions. So here is a model. 
So the iceberg model, so above the waterline, the more invisible part is we experience the structures and the processes, things that we can we can trace on a piece of paper or have, um, have just more, more consciously in experience. And then there's a culture really underneath the iceberg, the bigger part, the more unconscious part. So we carry these structures and processes in our mind and in our heart, and we consciously or unconsciously reproduce the same patterns over and over again. So sometimes it just called a mental model, right? So why is it relevant to, to team science, to convergence research? Because most of us are embedded in higher education systems that are very vertical. Right? Everything in higher education flows vertically, top to down. Decisions are made that way, resources are allocated that way. So we so we embedded and we very used to those structures, processes, and cultures. So inadvertently, we reproduce those. So not the same pattern. And then an asset comes in or an IH or those big founders and say, look, I want to incentivize horizontal collaboration. What that's nothing short of saying, now let's walk backward. It doesn't happen with a click of finger. You know, it takes a lot of capacity building, a lot of exploration about how do we do that and how do we teach people how to do that. So this is where adaptive space comes in, because by playing, by playing with those microstructures of process in, in, in each interaction we have when we come together, there is opportunity for us to change the culture. Right? We start with small and gradually it changes the culture. So I often jokingly say adaptive space is just a fancy term for meetings, but with a strong infusion of intentionality. So very consciously, we ask these four questions. So purpose, why are we having this meeting? Right? So outcomes, what are the objectives and key results are we looking for from the meeting? And facilitation, how are we going to run this meeting? And participants, who needs to be involved? So many times meetings become routinized, right? So like, okay, that's just the meeting with these people and we have at a fixed period of time. But like the, we don't, it become, it, it become just a little bit unconscious. So, so adaptive space really having this come helps us to really examine and scrutinize that we really need that meeting to avoid the meeting bloat and suck our time, that suck our time. So in one of my most successful um, team science articles published with the I2 Insights blog is called Three Complexity Principles of Convergence Research, where I outlined three types of adaptive spaces. So I'll start with, with my learning edge, which is the whole person immersion. So I very much want to explore further in, in this, uh, where you know we come together, uh, an adequate amount of people, requisite, requisite variety, as what we say in, in complexity. We live together. We eat together, we laugh together, and then we work together to really create connections that are beyond the mind and really get to know each other beyond the constraints of the screen. So I have been, I was able to play with it by with hosting two-day all hands in-person retreats, but I think there are a lot, a lot more potential um, there with longer periods of time and more selected group of people um, to with a more specific purpose. So, and then uh, another type is deep integration. So deep integration takes energy. You know, it is a very, very steep hill to climb. So most likely it is gonna happen in a small groups of three to five, and then gradually it spreads into the bigger team. So convergent circles is a potential type of, of adaptive space um, to support that deep integration with very intentionally designed structures and processes. And then there's a third type um, in my article, I talk about affective relationship. So this is the most interesting one. So there was once my husband and I struck up a conversation with a retired engineer in a restaurant. And he asked me what I do. And I said, well, I help engineers to collaborate better. And he said very sarcastically, he said, oh, do you make them group hug all the time? And I was like, I wish it were that easy. <laughs> I wish you could develop effective relationship by group hugging all the time. If anybody know any shortcut to developing affective relationship, let me know, <laughs> right? So for the, what is affective relationship? For the co hardcore scientists, it's the fluffy stuff, 
right? That is a little bit beneath them. <laughs> it's a touchy feeling thing. They, they don't know whether it belongs to science or not. But for a properly trained social scientist, <laughs> Affective relationship is trust, it's psychological safety, it's a friendship. It is really that invisible hand that touches upon all aspects of the team life. So, uh, and then surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, several colleagues in the team science community came to me and thanked me for articulating the need for affective relationship. So there's a lot, a lot of work to be done in this area as well. So this is a little bit um, on the theory side. So the next I'm going to share uh, some examples of adaptive spaces, five of them. Um, just real quick, if you want to learn more, um, I have writing stuff I can share. So the first is from ideas to projects. And the second is cross-expertise, cross cross-project cross learning. The third is collaboration capacity building. The fourth is leadership coaching. And the last is all hands in person meeting. So before I dive into the examples, I really want to specify the team context where these examples arise, uh, arise from. So there are three main characteristics, tackling wicked problems with both scientific and societal significance, requiring deep integration that will eventually lead to new meta disciplines, and consisting of more than 10 KPIs and more than 20 team members and engaging a wider community. So these are large teams tackling really big problems um, that comes from very diverse disciplines. Uh, so they basically fall under convergence research. Right? That is this newest term NSF has been uh, populating. Um, but it doesn't have to be specifically called convergence research if you fulfill one or all of those characteristics. So the first example is um, from project, from idea to project. So, you know, like academics, we are very concerned about publication, right? But without publication, you wouldn't have, but without projects, you, you wouldn't have publication. And without ideas, you wouldn't have projects. So we need to think about how to convert, how to convert ideas into projects, just as we need to think about how to convert projects into publications. Right, so, so developing a systematic support infrastructure for moving ideas into projects is really, really very important. And especially the larger the teams get because, because of diverse disciplines and a lot of team members don't even know each other, right? So this is, I would say, fall into a deep integration category if we use the, the framework I, I talked about. So this, is, this article is gonna come out is going to come out at I2 Insights pretty soon. Um, but uh, this is how it works. I call it double helix. So you have two these two strands. So one is new idea deep dive, one is cross idea learning. So new idea deep dive can be done in smaller groups, but you need the team-wide events um, to facilitate the cross idea learning. And the whole process takes about six to eight weeks where we're interweaving interwe idea-specific gatherings and cross-idea learning events. So you start with an ideation workshop where you gather as many researchers as, uh, as you can gather in, across the entire team or very cross-disciplinary and the, across the academic spectrum from students to full professor, whoever it's a call invitation that is sent to the entire community. So to, to the entire team. Um, so whomever wants to come, they come. And during the ideation workshop, so we generate research questions that people are interested in exploring. We forms, uh, we, we open breakout rooms for people to deep dive into the research question that has the most support. And then we, uh, by the end of the workshop, we want people to sign up to nascent, um, what did I call it, idea, uh, uh, idea work groups. So the, this is not a commitment, it's, a, it's an explorative thing, right? I'm interested. Right, I resonate. So let's explore. So, and then, so that's what the interweaving comes in. In the following two to four weeks, the topic leaders, they're supposed to call for these idea work group meetings and continue to explore the ideas. And then we will come together for another team wide event, 20, somewhere between 20 to 40 people, where where those ideas, so usually you end up for team size with, you know, 20 KPI. Uh, you end up with somewhere between three to six ideas. 
So then we come back and hear from those three to six, six idea work groups. So what they have talked about in the intervals and uh, um, what are their learning? What are their challenges? So we hear the short little presentations and then we open the breakout rooms again. And the participants will usually do two rounds so that participants can, can get exposed to different to different ideas, the cross learning happens. And then same thing afterwards, you know, you, you heard from the big group, you got your input, and then go continue to develop, continue to incubate your ideas in the coming two to four weeks. And then we'll have a focus tank. What the focus tank does, does is in addition to facilitate cross project learning, you also map the team assets and uh, start forming project teams. Right, so so in the folks tank, you start with the project leaders, the topic leaders again, talking about their ideas with much more substance than and the peer learning, and then they, and then again we open up breakout rooms, smaller groups, so where the invitation is for the team to talk about what the assets we can draw on, their literature, their data sets, are their uh, contacts. Um, Whatever that you can contribute, you can. You are also invited to sign up if you want to be a core team member and really committed to pushing this forward, or be an auxiliary team member where you want to be an observer, contribute when you when you want. And then after that, there will there will be project team formed. So most at this point, most teams still need further assistance to really launch into a full blown project, starting collecting data, uh, et cetera. There, there is still some miles to cover. But when you think about compared to when they started, where it's just individuals thinking, I have this idea in my head, am I the only crazy one? <laughs> so over the course of six to eight weeks, we have traveled quite a long distance. Um, so that is that is one example of this whole process of uh, supporting idea idea generation to project. So another example, um, the second example I would like to share is cross expertise, cross project learning. So that also falls into the deep integration category. So one one meeting format that can that have run with teams very successfully is like is this. So be it. So most of these teams, you have a need, there's a need to, to learn expertise and that is not yours, but you need you know, to, to advance the research agenda, agenda or learn from the project that you're not part of, but are related to yours, right? So that is a very prominent need um, that is almost universal to all cross-disciplinary project, cross projects. So, the way we can run this team, run this meeting is you can have a quick check in, quick announcements. So <laughs> immediately this is different because in some meetings, the announcement take more than half the time, right? It's people talking about what they have done and stuff like that. And most other people are checked out. So usually we do our checking and announcement before the meeting in, in, in our um, um, platform so be the discourse be the teams be it uh base camp be it slack so you collect those updates before so that you kind of already everybody comes into a meeting with a great situational awareness because my philosophy is, my philosophy is always meeting time when you have that face-to-face -face time is much better utilized leverage and collective wisdom than sharing information you know updates is a form of sharing information that can be done asynchronously so and then when we go into either expertise or project connection, so it's very important we send the right invitation. When you make the presentation, make it in a way that builds connection, not make it in a way that only highlights your personal achievements, right? So make it talk about your vulnerability as well as your strength and talk about what we can accomplish together. So a short presentation, short and sweet, almost the presenter serves almost as a conversation instigator. So you leave your audience with conversation prompts, and then you open up breakout rooms so where people can engage in a small group, the dialogue, the conversation prompts. So a lot of times we what we see in this time of meeting is you have a very long presentation that, very, that are hard for people who are not from your discipline to relate to. Right, and then there will be a, a Q and A with everybody in the big in the big room, with only one set of conversation going on. 
To me, that is huge waste of learning opportunities versus if you could open breakout, breakout rooms for everybody to relate in small groups about uh, what, what they have learned. So, I mean, if that can be blown out into blown up into an entire uh, research meeting, 45 minutes, if, if there's more time, we can do a wise crowd where, where we talk about our challenges, you know, where the people who have the biggest challenge become the, the, the clients and everybody else rally around them as their consultants and crowdsource solutions. So this is a routine thing I run with the teams I work with and almost Almost every time on a scale of one to 10, the consultants raise, raise their, the clients rate their consultants uh, as like 11, way off the chart wide. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times we have this, we have this uh, challenge of researchers, scientists don't want to ask questions. You know, they don't want to be vulnerable, don't ask questions. We got to create the right conditions for, for people to ask questions. So when you say, now we're gonna bid, who, whoever has a question that when the bid is going to become our, our um, client, and then all of a sudden it become a very desirable thing. You know, <laughs> we're competitive anyways, when to compete who has the biggest question and then who, who is gonna receive the most support. So that's one example of adaptive space for cross expertise, cross project learning. And then the third example I would like to share is collaboration capacity building. So, um, you know, like, like I talk about, you know, <laughs> when we are all so used to, to vertical, this work, vertical kind of way of working, now we want a horizontal. There's a lot of a, uh, a lot of capacity building that needs to happen. So for one example would be, okay, how do we make decision collaboratively, right? We're very used to making decisions being made for us and then roll it out, <laughs> right? Roll it out. I don't know what you can roll what out, but really you're just battling the resistance from a poor decision that is made without input from people. So how can we do collaborative decision-making? Well, we don't have to reinvent the wheels. There are many, many, many scholars who have practitioners who have studied it. So let's see if we can, we can learn it in one hour. Um, or at least some of it. So again, we start with the check-in and the process overview, and we spend about 15 minutes explaining the concepts and the tools for collaborative decision-making. You know, we don't have to go into a long and laborious uh, lecture. These are not scholars who want to become, who wants to do research on collaborative decision-making. These are scientists who just need to know very practical tools that they can, uh, that they can implement in their teams. Right, and then we spend about twenty minutes applying the tool to a real decision that the team needs to make. So there, there will be plenty of of options. For example, where to host the next annual in, annual in person meeting? Do we rotate it or or do we hold it in the same place? So that's a decision that we want the whole team to make together. Right, that's a low stake decision. So and then what we do is we meta reflect. Well, we we learn the tool, we just use it. How did it work? What are the what are the roles bottom for? And then we spend the last few minutes check out what's your biggest takeaway and what do you want to learn more about? So I usually advocate in this kind of collaboration capacity building workshops, no more than 20% of the time, uh, no more than 20% of the time on lecture. Majority of the time it should be an interactive activity for team members to relate to the content and for, for the team members to relate to each other. That is super, super important because that through that peer interaction is how learning sticks. You know, otherwise it's just gonna be something else we eat that can cause indigestion <laughs> instead of nourishing, in nourishing the team. Okay, so leadership coaching is something new that I have been uh, experimenting. So for those of me who those of you who have known me for a while, uh, this is basically a uh, a process that I have learned from Theory U. Then Theory U, I've been hosting um, coaching circles for a very, very long time. And um, I'm adapting the process to, to the science teams. <laughs> I had this quote, I made up this quote, is that the law of attraction is much more effective than art of persuasion. <laughs> so in, in, a, in a large cross-disciplinary team, different team, different scientists have a different levels of readiness to collaborate. You know, so, so not everybody's gonna be super collaborative right off the bat. So, and that's totally okay because the cultural change takes time, but there will be people who are more ready than others. 
So as a team scientist, I always start working with those that have more ready. So that's why I said the law of attraction. You know, there are people that are just naturally attracted to this way of working. So we work with them first. We energize them, build capacity for them first. I usually invite those people into my leadership coaching circle, the first batch of them. So you, how, how this could be done is we start with the challenge. So what is one challenge you would like to focus on today? We don't have to boil up the ocean. There's one challenge that we would like to focus on today. So everybody type that into the chat and then we'll go around, invite everybody to elaborate on that. And then we have a moment of stillness where we, so that is where the, the, the theory you comes in is it is really the quality of listening that, that makes the difference. You know, it is not advising because when we listen, when we bear witness to each other's challenge, and when we can help each other to have a new perspective to their challenges, and that is where that's where things start to shift. You know, it's really not about advising. So we have a moment of stillness. Let let the um what we have what we have heard sink in, and then we do mirroring. That is the listening right, in action, mirroring. So share an image, a metaphor, a feeling, a drawing, or gesture that came up in the silence or while listening to the challenges. So everybody see the commonality. You know, we're all working on the same team. The challenges we face are very similar. And then go deeper. What are we all lying for? What are the underlying needs we all share? So that is where we collectively listen to each other and listen to the whole energy field to the whole field, right? And then we engage in generative dialogues. You know, what new perspective and insight did we gain? Go with the flow, build on each other's idea, no pressure, no pressure to fix or resolve. And then the last is action. You know, everybody claim one action item you would like, to, you would like us to hold you accountable for. And then we send everybody away with action confidence. What can we offer to each other to enhance their action confidence? And then at the next coaching circle, we start by checking in on the action item. And then we start the whole cycle again. So this is another an, an example, the, uh, the fourth example of adaptive space that I have held. And then the last example I would like to share is all hands in person meeting. So every Every all hands in person meeting are different because the, the, the teams are different developmental stages. You know, there are different objectives and the key results. But these are the, some questions that I find very, very helpful in asking. So the first question is, how might we provide an opportunity for more people to, to shape the agenda, to contribute to the agenda? So you know, a lot of times the agenda is decided only among a small handful of people. Sometimes it's just the PI and the facilitator. I find that not adequate and it's not collaborative. So usually when I facilitate the all hands meeting, I go on a one-on-one -on -one interview with at least 10 people, about a third of the core team member at least, to see what they what they want. So it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity to learn, to learn about everybody's experience, to just check in. Right, and also just hear from them what they think we should accomplish. And then what are the objectives and key results, right? It's just as important to know what not to do as it is to know what to do. You never want to cram your, cram your meeting with the agenda. There, there's no room for people to connect, to connect all the new things to emerge. So what do we need to do before, during, and after? How might we utilize the event to generate momentum? Right, and all hands meeting is not, it's not, it, it is a distinct event, usually an annual event for the whole, for the whole distributed team, virtually distributed team to come together. So it, it is a distinct event stand alone, but it is also one stop on a continuous journey, right? So I never have any anxiety about, oh, what we put agenda, what we don't put on agenda, because whatever we don't get to put on agenda, we can do before or after. Right, so so and usually it is a great opportunity to generate momentum for whatever needs to, to be done. Once you put the topics and people's name on the agenda and they are go, they have ownership and the claim, they claim responsibility. So and how might we plan for emergence? Super, super, super important. There is always open space. Um, open space, you know, like ideally there would be in a two-day meeting, there should be at least two hours of open space where people can propose agenda items and have each lead small groups to talk about those agenda items. And um, having having abundant breaks, 
usually usually I have at least half an hour break in the morning, half hour break in the afternoon, one hour lunch break, so people can interact the way they can have those serendipitous interactions. And also staying in the same hotel helps. <laughs> you run into each other all the time and the interaction just happens very organically. And how might we identify and amplify assets on the team? Um, so I almost always have provocateurs, you know, people who are outstanding in certain areas that is related to the agenda item. We invite those team members to come and be provocateurs. I almost never invite people outside the teams because there are only the assets in the team can carry the team forward. There are plenty of them, always. Okay, so wow, okay. So the lifeline of adaptive space, I will be, I will say, is the give take dynamic. Because here's my little doubt, right? So the question is, what does this person need from this configuration of the team during this period of time? And what does this configuration of the team need from this person during this period of time? So each configuration is different, right? Because each meeting is different. If we, if we ask these four questions, a lot of times a meeting. You know, you hear people say, you know, I'm in to this meeting. I never talk. I don't know how relevant this, what he said is to me. I don't really do anything. I don't know why I'm there. You know, so there was not a give and a take dynamic, right? So is there, so, so even if there's something needed by that person, does that person need to be there for the whole 45 or one hour? So is that a piece of information you can get as the meeting convener? You can get from that person in a five minute conversation or in a quick email. Right, so so that person needs to be. Is there a strong give and take dynamic throughout the entire meeting for everybody involved? So for me, that is kind of the lifeline of adaptive spaces. And here are some secret sauces that I have um, summarized. Really, is a dual focus on learning and belonging. You know, it is. So it is the content and what what is said. It is also the relationship. So both are important. So. So the first, to, to, to put it a more concrete, the first is quality of the presence. You know, does the facilitator care, you know, or is it just there to tick off a box? Does the participant need, want, and are open to the contents, right? How many workshops are just tick off boxes? So quality of relationship, is the facilitator and the participants in relationship? Are there opportunity for the participant to relate the contents to their personal context and relate to each other, right? So in this sense, really, the facilitator is like a conversation instigator instead of a knowledge holder, right? So the quality of the contents. So does the facilitator have lived, lived experiences of the contents? And can they make the teaching relevant to the participant's context? So those are all just super, super important for somebody who really lived, who really practiced what they preach. It's very, very different than somebody who's just, you know, like a parrot talk, learn just, just borrowing from whatever theory they read somewhere and uh, um, just, you know, <laughs> repackaging it and send it to somebody else. So here's some philosophical musings. So recognize the convenient power and fulfill the responsibility. Anybody who calls a meeting, you are exercising convenient power. And there's a tremendous responsibility uh, in, in being a good steward of people's time. Right? I often say when you, if you call a one-hour meeting for 10 people, it's not one hour, it's 10 hours. That's more than a work day. Right? So there's tremendous responsibility in leading that meeting effectively. Avoid under control or over control. So we can leverage breakout rooms, chats, virtual collaboration tools that alone can just make the meeting so much more interactive and effective. And also learn facilitation methods. You know, there are established schools of thoughts such as liberating structures, human-centered design, agile methods. Those are, what I would say, those are tools. You know, what are tools? Tools are, mat tools are materialized competencies. Somebody has figured it out. You just need to learn it. And they can really make a very, very big difference in the meeting dynamics. And create the key is create enabling conditions for interaction and interdependence. That was why my tagline uh, was inter on interaction inter interdependence for adaptive space, right? And I will also advocate 
at me during meetings, the synchronous in face to face meeting prioritize leading people over managing tasks. Right, so you want to focus on capacity building instead of accountability, and you also want to focus on problem solving, sense making, decision making over information sharing, because accountability and information sharing can be done asynchronously, uh, with all the management tools we have, and maximize what is best for all all present, not what is best for a fragmented group. Too many meetings we have been to where only like one third. Oh, a quarter of the people are activated. Everybody else got their got their phone, got their screen turned off. You don't know what they're doing, right? So that is not a good meaning. You always want to maximize what is best for all present. If if those people who are not engaging, they know to be there, let them go. What do you have them there for? What do they add to your meaning, right? And then also pay attention to the feeling quality. Is it energy giving or energy draining? That is a, a very good, very good standard. I've been to meetings where walking away, I feel like I'm flying, you know, just so much energy. And there are meetings, I mean, I think about it, I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I was sick today. <laughs> so, right? So, so that is, a, that is a, a, another indicator to see whether, whether um, your meetings is a good adaptive space or not. And then the last thing, precondition for high quality meeting is high quality individual preparation. So I will say since COVID, we have a lot of us are stuck in this loop of business. You know, we just want to we want to see meetings on our, on our agenda. At least we can say we've done something. But the thing is, when there were so many meetings, there's no time for quality individual preparation. So everyone comes to the meeting not prepared. So and then you walk away with meeting with, without really without real uh, momentum and then <laughs> right that you see how how that that appearance of business that trap of business can really keep a team stuck from real momentum you know i want to share a story when i was at, when i was at pittsburgh i was i was riding a bus with a colleague and he was like oh i'm i'm flying out to seattle to 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 see jeff bezos at amazon so oh wow that's exciting so no it's weird so what, what's weird about uh, about it he said they have their meeting the first 45 minutes, nobody says anything. They just sit there and read reports, <laughs> right? Because they assume nobody is prepared. So the first 45 minutes, everybody, and they also no PowerPoint presentation is about. It has to be a full report. So the 40, I'm, I'm only there for two hours. For the first 45 minutes, I'm just gonna sit there, have everybody read my report. So why at least be honest? <laughs> you know, at least they don't come and pretend they have prepared and then ask random questions and take the whole group off track. At least they're honest. So, okay. So I think, okay, okay, here. So, oh, wow. Okay, 45 minutes. So we, we don't have to go to the third part. We can just, uh, um, we can just pause here and hear from the audience. So if you could type into the chat something that resonated with you, or something you want to learn more about, or if you have divergent thoughts, and then we're going to have a conversation. So I will paste this into the chat.
Wow, so many good comments. Okay. So, Canon, do you want to um, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I just um, grabbed it from my notes, and so it's a little bit wordy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was really struck by, I, I absolutely agree, the check-ins can take a long time. And I've been noticing in one of the groups that I meet with, they've been getting longer and longer. So I see that issue as a big issue. But when you do it on Slack or Basecamp, how do you know people are looking at that? And what use does that serve? And might there be a different way to approach this question of catching us up on what each member of the team has done? That's a good question. Um, the short answer is that um, the facilitator at least reads it. Um, you know, if I were facilitating a meeting, um, you, sometimes I would write a quick summary of the updates and at the beginning of the meeting, read, read it, the update. The, the, what's new. So usually I have three questions. What's new? What are your challenges? And what are your questions? You know, a lot of meetings, what's new, just take up half the meeting already. <laughs> but really, what's engaging people is what's what's challenging and what are your questions, <laughs> right? So sometimes I would write a quick summary about what's new and just read it out at the meeting, and then uh, so design the team, design the team meeting around the questions and challenges. For example, you can have a wise crowd right around people who have the biggest questions. Uh, or open up breakout rooms, just you know, for people who who hey A and B, you you seem to have really big questions. Can you lead a conversation around uh, around those those questions or those challenges? Um, it, it can also you know, if you don't want to do base camp or Slack, you can just ask people to answer the question right on the spot through chats. So that's what I say: avoid under under control and over control. Because if you use people ask people to write in the chat, very it's almost you open up, you know, all the parallel rooms. Everybody can write and then in the chat. Because, <laughs> you know, we like to hear ourselves talk. You know, the more we talk, the more we want to hear us talk. And that's why it takes so long, so long. <laughs> right? So that's that's like a little trick I use all the time. Not talk. Let's just ask questions. Let's just type in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I love help? that. And I'll just put one more seed in here, which is, that question of what the purpose is and knowing that sometimes people have key information that they don't realize is key. So just this challenge of how do you make sure the right information is making it into the soup? So thanks, mm. Jenna. Mm. Yeah, that's very, I mean, that's concerning whom we invite as well, right? So, okay, that's good. Okay, with me? If, if, uh, would you I... like to, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Can I, oh, sorry. Oh, can I just go ahead, go ahead, add, add to that? Um, just because it's something that's, <laughs> that's been brought up with me recently, and I was actually blamed and pulled aside to the woodshed, so to speak, and told that I was being disrespectful for letting the check-in question go for so long. Um, and two things about that, right? I, I totally agree with Jimmy here in that, like, I, I think a lot of reasons that people feel like it's a waste of time is because uh, it often comes off as like, hey, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Whereas who cares, right? How can we make it more meaningful to the to meet the objectives of the meeting, right? And that's always my aim when I when I when I design an agenda is to it's it's not a check in just for us to be talking to each other, folks. <laughs> it's like an opportunity for us to find relatedness and to connect with one another around one of the objectives of the meetings, right? So. And that's the other thing too, is that I believe that people, you know, that groups exist for people to be in fellowship with one another and to be in relationship with one another. I agree. And I also believe that meetings exist for people to do something through interaction that cannot we be, that cannot be done otherwise. If it can be done otherwise, send me an email. Like seriously, like we don't need to come together. So what are we doing in this space? Right? It's gotta be something doing. And I, I'm a big fan of interactive methodologies. That's my that's in my DNA. So not only do I have a check-in question at every meeting, I also design some sort of interactive activity, like a like a bag toss or a wind blows or a human knot or something. And then I use that to demonstrate the dynamics of like what it is to work together, you know, and for us to kind of start getting in front of those things as opposed to complaining about it later on. And then I close every meeting with a reflection piece. Like I I, and folks don't get it, right? But they're, they, I mean, and they talk right up to the end. And I'm like, hey, folks, I mean, five minutes, I need that because I need to learn something from you, right? Like, how, how did this stuff hit you? What are you walking away with? A highlight, low light, tear it apart. I don't care, but I need to, I need to hear from you. Um, 
and, and also just to kind of go back to the check-in question, um, in addition to making it relevant to the objectives of the meeting, it's also, I, I find also that it's um, like, I, I give it a time limit and say to the group, like, hey, we got 10 minutes. Look at that. We got 30 people on the screen. Be quick. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and let the group manage itself. Um, because if I'm not there, then how, how, how else does this happen? And my, one of my goals is long-term sustainability, right? So I can come in and crack the whip and police groups, but I'd rather the group police itself. Stop there. Great, you're a kinder spirit. <laughs> awesome. Yes, I mean, check in and check out, I think both important, you know, a good beginning is to have success, you know, so a lot of times we start meeting with everybody not ready and their minds still on something else. So one of my favorite checking questions is what is keeping you from being present, you know, wow, the chat just starts to fly in, you know, pick up children, a grand deal, the this, the that. So once you say that, we say, okay, we collect the bear witness to what is keeping us present. Can we, can we let that go for just the following 45 minutes? You know, so, and then you create a really energy, energy giving space that everybody walking away all fired up and then they can go do whatever is keeping them from being present. <laughs> they can be present to that, right? So that often jokingly say, and we want to transform FOMO to JOMO, you know, <laughs> fear of missing out to joy of missing out. <laughs> Because I want, I know what the meeting the meeting is not for me, and the meeting is for me. So joy of missing out and joy of being present. Okay, so I want to. Okay, so I want to invite uh, uh, this person, this J K E J K E Y T. Um, where is that? You there, J K E Y T? Gemma, that's I'm Joanne here. Keaton. Yeah, so glad I had to have her. I was muted and off video. Yes, tell us, tell us a bit more about your comment. I mean, it's really well, insightful. The fundamental problem is the grant is supposed to produce science, and so when they look at the budget for the grant, they want to spend maximum number of dollars in producing that science. And there's very little time, there's very little money left over or space in a grant for a facilitator or someone to help them with their team science stuff or for whatever else they need help with, which is a lot, we all know that. And it's how do we get them to listen to that? We can make it better if we can do these kinds of things because now it's costing them money from the grant and it's costing them personnel. And I think it's really important that we figure out, and each grant would be different because the people in it are different. Um, some people at my university get this very easily that it's gonna be better if we let Joanne help. Other people, oh no, we can do it all. We know team science, we work in teams and we know what they mean. I, I, I think that maybe as a community, we're talking to ourselves sometimes rather than talking to those people who are the top scientists and they're really what they're doing or they're running multi-million dollar businesses. So if we put our top scientists who are the grant getter, think about them that way, what can we do? What can, how can we persuade them to get their attention so that we can demonstrate uh, more fundamentally how this made their grant better? And obviously then we have to connect it to their outcomes and the outcomes that we all know in science grants, we say what the outcome should be, but the outcomes are not always that. They are worried about the outcomes. We need to tie our processes into those outcomes more explicitly, I think, um, because I think that's the only way we're gonna get their attention. They always want my attention at the front end. <laughs> and then they go, oh, like we can do this ourselves. Okay, fine, go off and do it by yourselves. Um, and then they, at the end, oh, I really wish we kept put, put money in you for the budget. I mean, that, that's really important. So I, that's the piece that I always struggle with. I think as a group of scientists, social scientists, we understand team science. We know what we're doing. I think for me, the pressure point is convincing a group of scientists to put money and time, and it's both, in the budget. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a shared pain point for everyone. Um, 
you know, for everyone here in, in, in team science. <laughs> That's again, I was say, you know, the law of attraction works much, works much better than the art of persuasion. <laughs> so usually there are scientists who are who are more receptive than than, than others, right? Jenny, Jen, Jenny Grandmeier's team, um, they they made budget for a five year engagement with with team science, right? Yep. There are scientists out there. So once you do a good job, you really create an experience that is very different than their previous experiences. Usually, usually scientists they don't they are not born that way. You know, most scientists think I can do this, right? And then they run into difficulties when they when they when they do their previous grant. They say, "Oh, I learned." You know, somewhere I know there is this thing called team science, and then and then their next grant they're going to have a team science there, and then they have a good, better experience, and then they become a good advocate among their science peers, right? Where and then gradually we can create momentum. Right. It is, I, yeah, I would definitely acknowledge it's a collective pain point for team yeah, scientists. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to load some of the activities and some of the processes that we know onto them, however. You know, you're, you're, a, a team has to be a team for a considerably length of time to really know what they're doing and how well they're doing it. I mean, we, I always think of science teams as juries. They have no clue what they're going to do because their outcome is somewhat ambiguous. They don't know one another. They come from too many disciplines and too many different universities. And then we're asking them to create something that has never been created before. <laughs> and that a jury has to make a yes or no decision with people they don't know. So I've been trying to learn from that literature a bit. Um, it's a very different process that like we don't want juries to become a team so much because we want them to be independent. But every team, the science team that I've worked with, they are very independent, even though they're connected by the broader structure of the grant, right? And figuring how to make teams that good teams, we can always make teams, but to make good team structures within those um, has, is a challenge, I think. And I know the people on this, uh, this Zoom are all eager to do all of that. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with this comment. It just struck me is that we, we could be more effective if they would allow us to be in there. And I think sometimes they don't even want us to be in there. I, I've been told you can't come into the science lab because I don't want you to steal my secrets. Well, honey, I don't know what you're doing. So <laughs> I, can't, I couldn't steal them, right? But I think there's still apprehension and we, while we always work together moving our processes out to them, I also think we're, we, there's probably another level of activation that we need to be working on. And I would suggest those are the PhD students uh, that are coming up and out is to really do something for them that makes them understand team science and they can create their own opinion about team science versus taking the PI experience about team science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's definitely a marked difference uh, among generations. Yeah. You know, those scientists that are kind of 40 years or younger, it's an artificial thing, but but it uh, it's definitely their acceptance is very different than the older generation. Thank you so much, dear community. So I have put in the chat um, ways to stay connected with me, LinkedIn, Medium, and I publish quite often at the I2 Insights blog. And also I'm going to the, hope to see most of you in the Science of Team Science Conference. This is in person this time. Okay. Thanks so, so much, Gemma. Yeah. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. We'll Thanks. see you again soon. That was really good, Gemma. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really nice. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.